It says so it reached the soil. And in the soil, it gives rise to rabidity form larva. Of course, like under the ideal condition of moist soil or warm weather is there, right? So, they keep on feeding, taking their feed from the organic material in the soil. And after about seven days, the larva stop feeding and they keep the change and they develop into the third stage, in fact, a flariform larva. So, basically they are present on the grass and whenever they come in contact with the human skin, okay, they can enter the human. human. So, this larva outside the human body can survive up to approximately two weeks. And that's the reason. So, it's quite easy. Enter the skin again, again, like circulation, right heart, lungs, GID, start producing eggs. Remember this one consume hemoglobin. It have hemoglobinases. So this is about the life cycle and what is the clinical manifestations or the clinical features of this condition. Now, um, if we we'll talk about the clinical features of this one, Uh, the clinical features can be separated into acute features or acute manifestations. Uh, okay. Um, of course, like acute manifestation means what? Like, you know, it will enter the skin, it will reach the lungs, it will reach the GIT, that's it. Like, which is the same story as the previous one. Nothing different, okay? So, simply. And also chronic manifestations. Now, chronic manifestation, they result from the parasite in the intestine and they keep on consuming the hemoglobin. So again, guys, like uh, as in the previous lecture of uh, strong eloids, uh, I told you uh, the important thing, right, you know, how they have they have uh, cutaneous manifestations, pulmonary manifestations, and GIT manifestations. So you can say they have almost the same manifestations without any much difference, okay? So, like, uh, if, you, if, you, if you want to understand, like, what I'm saying, you can see my previous lecture in detail. So, of course, like, uh, you can say... Um, uh, what you can say like anyone uh, whenever they get uh, infected by this larva this one you know they have skin manifestation we call, call it as ground itch and what is ground itch it's a uh, itching a local pruritic um, erythematous and papular rash okay and it's commonly present on the hand or feet. So this thing uh, will be there, right? Um, now, uh, <laughs> what happens is, uh, um, like, uh, whenever this thing occurs, you know, uh, of course, like, uh, if the area is highly endemic or there, there is too much infections, you can think of this thing. But many of the times, like we can see some skin changes as well, like as the larva is migrating under the skin. Okay. As the larva is migrating under the skin. So we can see the tract of that, that larva, we call it as creeping eruption. We call it as creeping eruption. So creeping eruption, like maybe I can show you here on being um, creeping eruption. Um, you can see like, see, it looks like this, see, because the larva is moving under the skin. You can see over here or over here, right? A very, see, like the larva is moving under the hair, under the, under the skin in the subcutaneous region so we call it as creeping eruption 
see a lot of flower was right we call it as what creeping eruption so this creeping eruption can be seen right so uh, these tracks or these eruptions you know they can be elongated every day and uh, sometimes it can be there for years okay but when as soon as the larva will uh, like leave that area like these eruptions will be healed you can say within some weeks so you can say like after around one to two weeks of this skin infection uh, you can say there will be lungs manifestation okay you can say like this way that uh, after around um, um, one to two weeks the larva um, the larva reaches the larva reaches the lungs right so the larva reaches the lungs and again like in this one if you remember the lung manifestation you can talk about that right like simply um, cough will be there wheezing will be there um, wheezing, can be, wheezing can be there, cough, dry cough, or these things can be there, right? So, now, um, of course, like when the larva is ascending through the trachea, and then, you know, it will reach the pharynx, and then it will be digested by the, or taken up by the GIT. So, this thing is important. So, now, uh, when we ingest that, um, like uh, there could be acute symptomatic disease after ingestion. So what is this thing like the patient they present with nausea, vomiting, hoarseness and dyspnea. In some of the countries it is called as Wakana syndrome. Okay, not important to remember, but like in some of the areas, you know, this is called as Makana, Wakana syndrome. So, uh, simply like what it is ingested, if it will be reached the GIT or the intestines in simple words, you know, then the manifestation will be changed. Then it will be like uh, nausea, vomiting, abdominal pains, blotting, all this stuff. Okay. So now, like, uh, they will keep on uh, laying down the eggs, okay, and, uh, uh, like, uh, the patient will have, like, either these symptoms, which can go unnoticed simply. Sometime, the some of the patients, they have, like, acute enteritis with uncontrollable diarrhea and foul stools or very bad smelling stools. But, uh, like, uh, it can, there can be no symptoms as well, right? Uh, now, the person will reach or go into the chronic status or chronic infection. Now, the chronic disease is simply, guys, it is due to anemia. Okay. They keep on um, consuming your hemoglobin. Okay. And they stay in the small intestine and they keep on um, consuming the hemoglobin. Okay. And what will happen, like, uh, once they will keep on uh, consuming the hemoglobin, um, it is estimated like around 0.1 ml of the blood is lost every day, okay, which is like too much, sometimes up to 0.3, by the way. So, what will happen chronically is basically they have anemia. What kind of anemia? Simply iron deficiency anemia, right? They present with iron um, deficiency anemia. So, this will be the one of the manifestations. Now, uh, what will happen, because it's not like the anemia which will be there, but of course, like a lot of proteins will be wasted as well. So, people who have heavy hookworm infection, they may go into hypoproteinemia, okay? And uh, these are the two things, by the way, which basically cause too much burden on the children or developing children and the maternal uh, pregnant females, you know. 
Uh, and this is what you can say the main things by which, you know, most of the babies, they are uh, physically and intellectually not developing normal, okay, in many of the countries. So that's why they are uh, worried of this thing. Now, guys, if you know what are the features of anemia as well as what are the features of hyperproteinemia, I think, like, the rest of the story is clear. For example, anemia features are dizziness, weakness, paler, um, tachycardia, fainting, um, dyspnea, palpitations, things like this, right? And uh, uh, what you can say, like, uh, and hyperproteinemia, of course, they may have develop edema, for example, okay? So, uh, these are the things, you know, which can be there. And of course, like, not just these things, of course, like, these patients, they may have diarrhea and constipation as well. But these are the chronic manifestation of these this condition, okay? So, uh, this is how this thing present, right? Now, uh, so, okay, this one is too, creeping eruption is too, 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 you can say specific for this condition, right? And the diagnosis can be made at this stage or the thing you will start thinking about this stage. Okay, so how we diagnose this condition now? Diagnosis. So now the diagnosis again, the first of the thing will be, you know, stool microscopy, which is of course like from that CDC chart, you can see like, you know, we can see the eggs in the stools. So what happened like in the infected adults or in the affected humans, um, a single female, it produced thousands and thousands of eggs. So that's why, you know, when they produce thousands of eggs, you know, it can be easily found. Contrary to the previous lecture in which like they produce less eggs, you know, they won't produce, they produce good amount of eggs. So, as I told you, the eggs are colorless and uh, they are quite small, but they are colorless and there are special techniques by which they can see the eggs. For example, um, they can use formalin, ethyl, ethyl acetate sedimentation method. Um, and uh, some things are called as concentration procedures in which like they can um, dry up the amount and then they can uh, use some stainings, okay, to see the eggs like under the microscope. So this thing can be done. So uh, uh, now uh, other than microscopy of the stools, you know, CBC can be done in which like there will be eosinophilia. And it is a common finding, you know, we can see. Um, now, chest x-ray can be done, of course, to check for the lungs, when the pulmonary phase is there, or sputum examination can be done. Um, if, like, it is the time when it is migrating, you can, you can get this thing, right? You can get the test positive. Um, these things, and uh, uh, there are what you can say, um, other diagnostic methods are also there. Um, like uh, um, other than microscopy or stool culture. Um, so see, like the diagnosis can be clinical based on the uh, this cutaneous eruption. We call it, we also call it as cutaneous larva migraine. So like the larva is migrating, simply remember from this thing. Um, so there could be like the skin uh, groundage, there could be like this uh, cutaneous, sorry, uh, this, there could be this one or there could be like lung manifestation and uh, whenever it comes to the diagnostics, uh, we can do go for stool microscopy, okay, uh, uh, we can do for CBC, we can go for chest x-ray we can go for a sputum examination. And CBC will show what? CBC will show high level of eosinophils as well as microcytic hypochromic anemia. So this, these things can be done, right? So stool culture is one of them as well. Sorry, I wanted to write on this. Stool culture can be done as well. So these are the way of diagnostics of this condition and how we treat it treatment now again the treatment goal is to eliminate the worm completely from the GID that's an important thing okay 
and the most common drugs which are used again is uh, benzimidazole group for example uh, mibendazole mibendazole albendazole okay all these drugs can be given so uh, uh, like these both are by the way broad spectrum anti helminthic agents and uh, a single dose of mibendazole or, or albendazole you know single dose or multiple doses both are enough by the way so these, these this is what you can say is the treatment of this condition and uh, simply we give them um, any stage like even if you will found the patient you know at uh, any stage you know you can give these drugs and one of the drugs which, which I will talk about in the previous lecture as well Ivermectin so when you will study pharmacology you will study about Ivermectin as well we can use that as well so this thing and the other treatment is of course treatment of uh, um, chronic and stages of course like uh, treat um, anemia and treat uh, malnourishment okay and of course like how we treat anemia how we treat malnourishment that's a different discussion completely so the last thing guys which we are going to discuss in this one is the prevention okay prevention like we as we always discuss so again like uh, the first thing I will say like improve sanitation okay that that is the most important thing okay uh, in this one proper you can say personal protective equipment for people at high risk like footwear we should be there gloves should be there okay all this thing should be there so of course like this one because many of the people you know who work like in agriculture field uh, it's very hard for them so of course like they must uh, use proper PPE or personal protective equipment because you know this one they can penetrate the skin so of course that's an important thing and many of the people you know they use the feces as a fertilizer as well you know so this thing one thing is like treat the infections, give them drugs, of course. Um, in many of the countries, they used to give uh, albendazole or mibendazole to the school children and uh, just to decrease or... Uh, by the way, one of the thing, you know, uh, in our country, whenever the patients or the babies, they come to the pediatrics with the anemia, so they are usually given albendazole just to deworm them. So that that's the important thing. So uh, because you know, like they they cause like serious problems in the children, especially because uh, uh, their growth is affected, their development is affected when they have this infection. Um, now uh, you can say uh, other things which we can do is uh, um, other than this is like uh, of course like. Uh, Awareness of the condition, you can say. Awareness can be spread in the areas where this is endemic. Of course, like the people should be educated what to do if they found this feature, the sign and symptoms, they must go to the doctor. Uh, one of the things like um, education is very important in this case. For example, not just the people, but also the healthcare workers to um, deworm uh, whenever like anyone is presented with anemia for example so be warm them of course that is going to help a lot so that's all about guys about this ankylostoma duodenale and nectar americanus which are both hook forms and they cause such a condition